introduce Dr. Robert Roser for today's seminar series. Uh, Dr. Roser is the college's first Bennett Pierce, pro Professor of Caring and Compassion and leader of the PRC's Empathy Awareness and Compassion Program. His interests include contemplative practices like mindfulness and compassion, um, and education for staff and students, school, uh, schools as central cultural context for child and adolescent academic and social and emotional development, school reform and professional development, um, and India globalization and adolescent development. He has published numerous papers and received funding from the Institute of Education Sciences, the National Center for Complementary and Integrative Health, the William T. Grant Foundation, and it goes on and on and on. Um, he has also received many accolades for his work. Um, notably in 2017, he was United States Fulbright Scholar in India. Um, and I really look forward to hearing more about your work today, Rob. So I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you so much. All right, Ashley, thank you so much. It's uh, really great to be with everyone uh, during this time. Good to see some faces and um, going to talk about the art and science of human flourishing today, but we thought that uh, we would begin with an arriving practice to allow everyone to sort of come into the virtual space, as it were, and find their feet on the floor. So before I begin, I'll turn it over to Blake for that. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Rob said, since this talk is about the art and science of human flourishing, we thought we would try to uh, reenact what we do in the class each time we meet. Um, and one of those things is beginning with an arrival practice. Sometimes we uh, physically show up to a space, but we're not always mentally there. So um, if, uh, if you're willing, um, I'm going to invite you to just settle in for a moment. This is just a brief one minute little practice uh, just to bring ourselves um, a little bit of settledness. So if it feels comfortable for you uh, to, uh, to, to shift to find a comfortable uh, seat, if it feels right to close your eyes, um, I invite you to do so, uh, or even just simply bringing your gaze down uh, to the table or the floor. And just taking a moment to just take a couple of few deep breaths. Just sinking in to the feeling of the breath. Perhaps imagining with each breath that you're grounding yourself just a little bit more into the chair. Just allowing the body to be relaxed at ease. Allowing the breath to be relaxed, natural. Just noticing what it feels like to allow yourself to be breathed. Just noticing what it's like in this moment to let it all be. Noticing the sense of simplicity to this. Sense of compassion for ourselves. And then going ahead and perhaps uh, bringing some movement into the body, stretching a little bit. Sometimes our neck needs a stretch, our shoulders, our arms whatever you might need. Just bringing yourself back into the space, opening up your eyes, whatever way feels right to you. And just bringing that sense of presence uh, into the talk today. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Blake, for beginning us uh that way. And I want to just welcome everyone again on screen one and two. I'm going to share my screen. And uh, let's see. Put 
to over here. All right. So thank you. Thank you for that arriving practice, Blake. Uh, so today in the precious time that we have together, I'd like to talk about the art and science of flourishing. I know we have um, various people in the room who are interested and expert in this. And so I hope we'll have some time to engage in some questions about what I talk about. But really the reason we've come today to, together today is to answer the question, um, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life, PRCers? <laughs> no, just kidding, but uh, yeah. Uh, we can think about this. This is the invitation of the course, Art and Science of Flourishing, that I'm gonna talk about today. And as we tell the students, and my father used to tell me, uh, son, you don't need to have an answer, but maybe think about it a little. <laughs> and so that's what the course is about. And so um, after, uh, providing some background for why we created this course. I, I'll, I'll tell you a little more about it. This was our first uh, run of the course in 2017. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see, all right. So uh, what I'd like to do today is uh, five things in our time together. I wanna talk a bit about the social problems uh, that gave rise to the Student Flourishing Initiative, which I'll explain in a minute. Then I want to um, describe the uh, background of the course that we created uh, based on our perception of two unique social problems that we were trying to address. I'll present um, a series of research studies on the impacts and implementation of the course, as well as some follow-up research we did at the height of the um, pandemic, the first height of the pandemic in May, June. And um, then I'll end with some summary and future directions and we'll hopefully have time for comments and questions. So um, what I wanna talk about today is really a function of the Student Flourishing Initiative. This is currently a three university initiative, although we're um, on the doorstep of expanding to about 12 universities across the country. And um, it includes uh, colleagues, uh, David Germano and Karen Inkless from the University of Virginia. David Germano initiated the project with Richard Davidson at the University of Wisconsin and his colleague, John Dunn. And then Mark Greenberg and I uh, joined with Penn State. And the Student Flourishing Initiative was originally formed based on two observations that many of us had, and we were working together as colleagues in the field of contemplative teaching and learning prior to this. I think the first uh, social problem that we were thinking about and wanting to address together was what I'll refer to as the need for renewal in higher education. Um, there's kind of current, uh, there was a classically a tension that C.P. Snow um, <clears throat> named in the uh, middle part of the 21st, uh, the 20th century regarding the two disparate cultures of academics, uh, of academia, the arts and the sciences, and the exhortation there, and I think we're still working at this, was to try to create more interdisciplinary um, offerings in the university that brought together the arts, the humanities, and the sciences. And I think you'll see this course is in part a response to that ongoing challenge. And then second, there's really a more contemporary tension between two different kinds of cultures in education. I would say a press for more of a whole person, um, liberal arts kind of an education and the press for specialization and the job market. And I think this is a tension that every school is facing. And in a sense, um, our, one of our aims in this course was to bring a whole person approach to undergraduate education, specifically in the form of general education, because gen ed at Penn State and these other places all across the country are still trying to get more experiential, more interdisciplinary courses into the uh, curriculum, especially in the first years of a student's life. So part of our um, desire to come together as the Flourishing Initiative was to promote this kind of renewal and integration synthesis in higher education through the curriculum. A second challenge that we wanted to respond to as, a, as an initiative was the student crisis that many of us are aware of and that we see in higher education today. And I'll show you some data on this in a moment. 
but there has been um, a generational rise in the symptoms of anxiety and depression that we've seen among student populations attending undergraduate uh, study. Um, that includes young people who are coming to the university or the college with a history of mental health challenges. Maybe they've been diagnosed, maybe they're taking medicines. These are more prevalent than ever. And as the Chronicle Higher Ed um, exhorted us in this uh, uh, book on overwhelmed, uh, as they described certain uh, significant segments of the college age population, we really need systemic approaches uh, to making student well-being a campus-wide priority. This can't be something that's laid at the doorstep of student health services. We, we double them, we triple student health services, and the need is still unmet. So the invitation is, and this is sort of the bread and butter for the PRC, is to think about systems, um, to think about co-curricular, extracurricular, clubs, um, university-wide initiatives, as well as student services as a response to the student crisis in higher education today. So this was really to try to bring some renewal and whole person education to try to do so in a way that might impart skills to students that help them address the inevitable slings and arrows of daily life that have been magnified 10,000 times by the looking glass platform of social media today. And so I wanted to just show you some of the data on the uh, changes in mental health as well as challenges in flourishing and meaning that we see among college students today to motivate the background that I was just uh, alluding to. And so I'm going to draw on um, a recent paper uh, by Duffy and uh, Twenge and Joyner, where they looked at two different large scale college surveys that have been administered over the last decade and were trying to check, track generational change in college students' mental health. And so in this first graph, um, this is from the uh, American College Health Association's annual survey that was administered between 2011 and 2018. And as you can see, it includes almost 600, over 600,000 undergraduates. And um, what they've done is they've tracked, uh, they create certain cut points, given the continuity of measurement across different cohorts of uh, entering college students or college students who enroll in the survey rather. And as you can see on this graph, um, I can't, I don't know what's underneath there. Whoops, okay, I'll go back. <laughs> um, as you can see on this graph, um, the rate of what they call overwhelming, which is obviously in the upper parts of the scales they're using, overwhelming anxiety, anger, and severe depression have all risen in a considerable way among the college student population across this prior decade. And then what the authors did is they, um, they looked at a second survey that was uh, done with 196 uh, colleges and universities, and this included almost 200,000 students, called the Healthy Mind Survey to get another data source on um, student mental health during these uh, similar years. And so in this graph, again, it's a little bit hard to parse without color, but I think the, the largest uh, increased line that you can see is um, flourishing reversed. So what they're showing here is that across uh, 2007 to 2018, students who reported flourishing, and it's a scale that's similar to Martin Seligman's PERMA model of flourishing, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit in a bit, um, the lack of flourishing has increased along with severe depression and anxiety. So this second data set sort of corroborates the findings from the first across the same period, and now we're up to almost a million students here. And I'll just mention these, but I won't go into them quickly. If you kind of look further, they're really looking at it's not just sadness and anxiety and a lack of purpose and meaning, but we're really talking about um, hopelessness and suicidal ideation attempts and self-injury also increasing rather significantly across these same years in these data sets. So real striking data and, and kind of a cause for concern. And I know we'll have a chance to talk about some of these issues with our guests in the PRC later in the semester as well. 
And then COVID hit, you know, <laughs> as if the generational challenges that seem to be uh, afflicting college students, and there may be many reasons, and we can discuss that uh, um, uh, among ourselves as to why these generational changes are happening. But then we had the pandemic hit, and we know that on top of these generational challenges in student mental health, that it's, um, um, it is the case that um, this pandemic as a major uh, uncontrollable stressor is also adding increased burden on adults' mental health. And so this was a recent paper by Twenge and Joyner where they used census data um, to look at the changes in the prevalence of various mood problems from um, uh, the previous year to the time of COVID in 2020. And in general, what the authors found was um, that um, during the pandemic, um, American adults were three times more likely to screen positive for depressive mood problems and anxious mood problems, both um, or just one of them. So again, we have this generational rise and now we have this major stressor impacting the well-being and mental health of college students among adults writ large in our country and in the world. So I think we're aware of this background and many of us are working on it. I just wanted to provide some of the uh, data on these um, sort of social problems that we want to take a curricular prevention and health promotion strategy with regard to in the work that I've been doing with the Student Flourishing Initiative. And so, um, as we see in different parts of the country, this systemic approach to making mental health a priority, uh, student mental health a priority on college campuses is there. And part of the um, aspiration of the Student Flourishing Initiative is to draw together various universities that are doing this and to begin to create a clearinghouse and a sharing uh, platform for various different approaches, including curricular approaches. This development of new courses that may impart students with life skills, coping skills that they can use to practice um, sort of um, self-directed medicine <laughs> that they can use to help themselves, not as a cure-all, but as an adjunctive part of a systemic approach to student well-being. And we see courses like the Science of Well-Being at Yale that's also on Coursera that's attempting to do this. There's colleagues I've met at, the, at New York University who created such a course and are now marketing it under this uh, not a profit for profit institution called Youth Thrive. In fact, some of those folks say that's where the Yale course came from. <laughs> and then we decided to create our own course and um, gradually, um, university researchers are both registering, starting to try to study these courses in the way that I'll describe that we are today as well. So um, what I'd like to do now is to turn a little towards the Art and Science of Human Flourishing course, this course that was created in response to the need for renewal and the student mental health crisis across the three universities. And I just want to start out by saying, um, believe it or not, in the course, we take a very light touch to defining what human flourishing is. Um, so this is a word cloud and often on the first day we ask the students to reflect on this word and their associations with it. And in some ways, um, we leave them with a, with a rather open definition that flourishing has something to do with the realization of our deepest aspirations for ourselves and the world this life. And then if we need, if we get pressed further, um, we say something like, well, <laughs> it's beyond surviving, it's leading a meaningful and fulfilling life. And I'll um, talk more if you like about this invitational open approach that's attempting to be um, um, a little more than descriptive, but not too prescriptive, because that also can backfire, we think, developmentally. Um, uh, so um, I can talk a little more about that. But one of the main justifications and motivations that we tell our incoming students is that at this time in the developmental um, lifespan, the, uh, the brain and the body is particularly malleable, that is amenable to training 
And if flourishing requires us to learn new skills and perspectives, wow, <laughs> 18 to 30 years old is the prime time for this. This is the greenhouse for flourishing, we tell them, based on the um, tenets of developmental science. So use it or lose it. All of those ideas we really bring in here to motivate that um, young people, if they work a little on themselves, we tell them you're perfect just as you are. And you could use a little improvement <laughs> like the rest of us. This is a Zen saying by uh, Suzuki Roshi. Uh, at a certain level, absolutely perfect right now. And at a relative level, keep working at it. We tell the students if they do that now, it could conduce towards a lifelong set of habits and dispositions leading to meaning and fulfillment. As you might expect, the course draws on uh, social psychological um, uh, scientific, psychological scientific theories of flourishing. So we do try to bring in ideas um, that are central to views like Martin Seligman's, which tries to bring together these hedonic or positive emotion and pleasure oriented views of happiness with more eudaimonic or meaning oriented uh, perspectives on flourishing. And um, we kind of point out uh, some of the qualities of what a flourishing person may look like in the tradition of Carol Riff. We ask them to find someone and write a paper on someone who's flourishing. Um, but the idea is, um, one of the big ideas in the course is uh, no path, many paths. And so there's a sort of agnosticism with regard to what flourishing is, um, net a few key ideas about our responsibilities to ourselves and each other, and our responsibility to find what we're passionate about and what uniquely each one of us wants to offer to the world in our short time here. We also draw on a variety of contemplative cultural models of flourishing this year. Um, every year, teach about the Buddha's life and his view. This year I brought in Lao Tzu, such a beautiful approach that really brings in stillness and flow and nature. Uh, we talk about the philosophy of the Stoics that really believe that suffering was inevitable and we need to work on our resilience and our mental factors to uh, flourish. We have them this year read Viktor Frankl's book. Perhaps we try to bring together the hedonic and eudaimonic by teaching them about the Delphic Oracle who said you need to know yourself <laughs> if you're going to find out the secret and meaning of life and nothing too much. <laughs> All things in moderation on the hedonic side. This is very much like Buddha's teaching itself. Um, we see this in both the Greco-Roman and the Buddhist world. And then um, just one other thing I'll say, this year for the first time, um, we've been trying to be a bit more self-conscious with a lot, um, encouraging students rather to bring in their own uh, cultural uh, background and vision of flourishing. Perhaps they have a religious tradition or perhaps they're atheist, whatever it is. We're trying to encourage them not to check aspects of themselves at the door but to realize um, many pathways up the mountain and yours is welcome here, even though the kinds of training practices we're going to teach in the course are secular. We now call this secular open. They're secular and they're open to your own tradition and may in some ways enrich it. Um, we, we invite them to investigate that. And so over time, and primarily probably from more of a Buddhist perspective, we, we cobbled together our own theory of flourishing, which has these five main foundations and 15 related themes, many of which are chosen because they're seen as malleable, trainable skills or dispositions that have some both historical, cultural, and contemporary scientific information to suggest their key to flourishing. So we tar start with a, um, a set of foundations about what is flourishing, how does one go about transformation, and the need for resilience because of the ups and downs on this journey. We then talk about how everything hinges on the point of attention, everything begins in awareness. And so um, we start to teach them mindfulness and how to become more awake and aware. We then move into um, using our awareness to see the fundamental interconnections in the universe, 
in human life, in moral life. We talk about the value of compassion and the deep desire of every person, regardless of race, creed, or color, to belong and to feel safe in a culture and how both experiencing belonging and promoting that for others is um, our royal roads to flourishing. And then we talk about insight into our identity. We start to help them craft a vision and a sense of purpose and passion about what they're interested in, which takes imagination. And then the last weeks of the course, we ask them to start to think about how they're going to embody what they've learned with courage and with a community of like-minded peers to begin to bring their aspirations to fruitful realization and in the coming years. And so um, in general, I'll just say the course aims to explore uh, diverse perspectives on flourishing, I've said. We present science on flourishing each week and the, the particular theme that we're looking at. We introduce um, sequentially a series of mindfulness and compassion as well as yoga meditations. We've really discovered, rediscovered every year that the movement practices <laughs> like yoga, the students really love. There's something about attending to the whole body in motion before you try to sit quietly with the natural rhythm of your breath, <laughs> which seems a little bit more accessible and more of a scaffold to this work. So uh, try to remember that. And we think that through um, these explorations and practices, we can develop both the skills and a vision of flourishing. But um, overall, again, I'd say the, the, the ethos of the course is an invitation into inquiry. And we also emphasize um, quite a lot that it's not like we're at the other shore <laughs> calling the, the boatmen over with the, with the students on the boat that we're all on this journey together, not finished. Um, we're in this with them, as it were. The course was taught as a flipped course. That is, there was recorded lectures that were watched asynchronously outside of class. And in class, we try to blend some academic, but mostly experiential and social group learning. And the way we do that is through poems and stories, through scientific studies, through wisdom figures and traditions, and through the meditation practices themselves. These are just some of the books we read in the course. And uh, we can make these slides available if you'd like. And then uh, for those of you who are interested in contemplation, we introduce students to the usual suspects, the body scan, mindful movement, focused attention on sound and the breath, a beautiful letting be practice like Blake led us in today, which is a form of open monitoring or mindfulness practice. And then we also teach self-compassion, loving kindness, a little unforgiveness perhaps, Gratitude usually near Thanksgiving Day, and we really try to emphasize uh, mindful listening. That is listening without responding. Listening for the sake of understanding rather than listening for the sake of responding. We find that is a bit of a lost art today that we want to reintroduce to the students. Um, this is a theory of change that the group has created for the scientific studies of the course over the past three years. And on the left side of the diagram, um, the whole thing we believe begins with a safe and caring classroom and meditation environment. I should say the class has two group meetings a week, may say Monday and Wednesday, and then Friday is devoted to a contemplative lab that's usually run by people like Blake uh, uh, and Elaine, various um, uh, co-instructors. And uh, so we think this safe and inclusive environment is the crucible in which all learning happens. So we pay a lot of attention to that. So for instance, even now, Elaine and I are teaching the course. We, we devote three to five minutes every class, if you can imagine, to just asking the students to turn on their cameras and greeting them so that we can actually see them even in this virtual format because we think it um, in some small way, perhaps promotes a sense of community and belonging that becomes the predicate for extension of oneself and learning. And then um, we try to, within that context or crucible, um, offer two kinds of learning experiences that we associate with two different kinds of learning. One are experiential learning opportunities like the meditation exercises or 
partner or small group exercises we do. And this is sort of learn by doing. And we believe this cultivates procedural learning. That is something more like motor learning rather than top of the brain conceptual learning. I mean, it's both, <laughs> uh, but ultimately it's a kind of um, skill formation, like riding a bike that we think meditation cultivates. And then on the other side, there's the traditional academic learning with the lectures and the readings and the reflections on the readings and the class discussions. And we think this promotes declarative or conceptual knowledge, knowing what something is or how it works versus knowing how to stay calm in the presence of stressors. And so um, we look at both procedural learning outcomes in the form of attentional and social emotional skills and declarative learning outcomes in terms of some of the uh, perspectives on flourishing we're trying to get across in the course such that meaning making is critical and that at some level we all share a common humanity that is, we wish not to suffer and wish to flourish, each and every one of us. So we think those skills and mindsets are sort of the proximal precipitates of the course offerings. And we think those um, skills and views have functional consequences for downstream mental and physical health and risk behavior of the students. So I wanna turn now, we're doing pretty good on time. I'm just zipping through this on a beautiful fall day. Um, just turn to um, a little of the types of research we've done so far and give you a taste of that. And uh, um, we'll come in in time for questions, I'm, hope, I'm hopeful. Um, primarily we've been doing pre post quasi experimental match propensity score studies of the course across the three universities. That is, um, we all teach the course in the fall, uh, students enroll in the course, and then we've been soliciting a control sample, um, usually much larger than the number of students in the course to try to create a propensity match sample since we have not yet gotten to the point of randomly allocating students to the course or not who are interested in it. This is a, a goal of ours, but not something we wanted to figure out with the registrar before we figured out if the course worked. <laughs> and so I'm gonna tell you a little about those initial pre post studies. We've done one in 2018. We replicated it in 2019. We're doing it now 2020 with the online version. I'll tell you a little bit about a study we did of the implementation of the course in the first uh, year of study 2018 across three universities. And then I'll show you a little data from a follow up study um, that we conducted with all students 2018 2019 cohorts during um, May and June of this last year to see how the students were doing during the COVID pandemic. I should say because we've been collecting a lot of data, especially control group data each year, we're also investigating our own generational cohort study of how much anxiety and depression did the students show up with in our samples in 2018, 2019, and 2020. And I think as you can imagine, there's already a story there, although um, much of this data is still being processed as we speak. So <laughs> try to give you the best taste of it I can here. So I'm just going to show you a few, it's, I, and I apologize if I had had another, uh, <laughs> another mind, maybe <laughs> I would have done uh, a lot more pictures. So I am going to show you some tables coming through here. So please bear with me there. There's once in a while a figure and I wish there were more. Uh, but here's the uh, samples for the 2018 and 2019 cohort studies across the three universities. In 2018, we um, engaged in a two to one matching procedure, which led to 315 students in the sample. And um, you can see if you train your eye across the, uh, the columns that these are mostly first year students, that is they, they've just come to the university. Um, they're about 75% female. Um, this kind of course seems to attract uh, more females and we can talk about that. Uh, the course is about 70 to 75 percent um, white students um, with fewer African Americans, 17 to 10 to 17 percent Asian American and fewer African American and Latinos, as I said. And then there's about 5 percent of the sample that 
our international students. I can remember students from Iraq. We have one now from Saudi, uh, from China, from, from various different places. In 2019, um, we got better at drawing randomized samples from the entire university to use as our matched controls. And we engaged in a one-on-one -on -one match, so 117 people in each group, and pretty much the same demographic characteristics. Um, I'm not going to go into this much, and I probably can't, but thank God Mark and Blake are here. But <laughs> I believe this is really important to look at how the propensity scores um, were distributed, and we were able to match the treatment units with the control units. Uh, this is the distribution for um, 2018, 2001. There was um, a lot of uh, the propensity score matching went well, and I understand in 2019, this diagram shows a similar thing as you can see the units lining up there. Just tell you a little about the measures. Um, as I mentioned, I'll talk probably today, I'll just talk about some attentional skills um, as the proximal outcomes, do the students learn things like um, focused attention and being able to regulate their attention, becoming more mindful? Um, I probably won't have time to talk about social emotional skills or perspectives on flourishing, though there's some change there. I'm going to focus a little on mental health outcomes, symptoms of anxiety and depression, as well as symptom or um, the presence of well being or flourishing. And then I'll talk a little about compliance with uh, COVID-19 health guidelines that we looked at. Uh, I won't go through all the items, uh, measures item by item, but just to say we used um, measures from large scale surveys that are also done with college students. So the, the GAD was used to look at um, anxiety and the PHQ was used to look at depression. And we use something called the Pemberton Happiness Index, which really tracks on the categories of PERMA, uh, positive relationships, uh, positive emotion, um, and so on and so forth. So I wish I had a figure, but I don't. So in 2018, I'll show you the results pre to post test on the mental health outcomes. These are the results of a series of models um, in which um, we've included the pre-measure of the outcome measure. So these are really um, uh, change uh, estimates. And we've controlled for the research site or the university, the student's gender, race, first year status as well. And so what we found in 2018 was across the course of the fall semester, those 105 students in the treatment group reported uh, no change in their symptoms of depression and a slight lessening of their symptoms of anxiety across the semester, whereas the match controls um, showed an increase in both symptoms. And the effect on depression was significant at 0 0.05, whereas the symptoms of anxiety was uh, significant at 0 0.07, I believe. And then we also found those in the class reported um, improving well being over that time, whereas those in the control group were relatively flat. And so the course seems to have some um, immediate impact in helping students manage uh, aspects of mental distress. We reran the study in 2019 and one of those classic and critical errors where you take out a measure you really love happen. <laughs> we did recover and brought it back for COVID, but we lost our anxiety measure. Uh, but nonetheless, we actually showed that the change in depression across the fall semester in the 2019 cohort was even larger than the year before, although we have to calculate the D for that. And similarly, we found an increase in well being. So there's some evidence from the first two cohorts that the students are reporting that they're feeling less anxious and less depressed and feeling more of a sense of well-being across the course of the semester compared to controls. Our aspiration ultimately is to see if these kinds of skills and perspectives on flourishing mediate the impact of the course on the distal outcomes, although we haven't modeled that yet. 
what we've done so far is just looked at the pre to post impacts on these proximal skills between the treatment and the matched control groups. And so I'll just show you a few effects here. Uh, these are differences in three different measures of attention by group. The first is the attentional fun function index, which really measures something like executive function skills. The second is our ability to be aware of sensations in the body and not reject them. And the third is the classical five-factor mindfulness questionnaire of Ruth Baer and colleagues. And what we found in 2018 was that the um, treatment students reported increases in their executive function around attention and their somatic awareness. But uh, interestingly, we found no significant difference in mindfulness in this first cohort. And I think you can see the Ds, but I can't. Um, I think they're small to medium is what I, oh, wait a minute, I have them here too. <laughs> Anyways, they're there in the diagram and the effects on distress and well-being are also in the small to medium range. Uh, these results were replicated in 2019. We find that the treatment group reports greater increases in their attentional function in their somatic awareness and this time in their uh, mindfulness compared to the treatment group. So there's some signal suggesting that the core skills of the course, especially taught under that awareness module, um, the students self-report changes in those outcomes. I'll just take a brief quick tour. Um, there was more to say about the outcomes, but for time, I'm going to leave it now. There was some change in things like self-compassion and uh, the perspective of common humanity. What we didn't find a lot of change in was physical health. There was some signal around sleep and no impact whatsoever on the drug use and alcohol use or alcohol consequences question at either time points. No impacts on the distal health related outcomes other than sleep quality and quantity, which seem to be some leading indicators. We're still looking at that. Uh, this slide shows how um, we had observers in 2018 in the class just rate how each one of the instructors used the time during the 15 weeks of the semester. And um, the three universities, remember UVA, Penn State, and University of Wisconsin. So you may infer from the bars <laughs> which one is which college fans. Um, <laughs> but what you can see is that our friends in the red zone uh, were doing a lot more lecturing than our friends in the orange zone. And Penn State was just right. No, no I'm just kidding, just fell in the middle. We all did about the same amount of, devoted the same amount of class time to practices. And then um, sort of as the trade-off for lecturing, it looks like UVA and Penn State engaged in more um, interactive exercises in the class than Wisconsin. So even though it was a flipped course, you can see there was variation in the way that the different professors taught that course. Some resorting a bit more to the classic lecture style. And I would say our friends at UVA resorting to even more of a flipped course, probably the closest given the lack of lecture there. Penn State was somewhere in the middle. And so we did a lot to try to understand the pedagogy. And then we tried to understand just in a descriptive way, because we only have three universities, we don't have enough units to do multi-level modeling. We just wanted to understand how variations in pedagogy may have affected the kinds of outcomes students achieved. And so we looked at pre-post gain scores in certain outcomes in the study across the three universities and compared the effect sizes. It took us quite a long time to try to come up with some descriptive way to do this. And to make a long story short, what we believe we found was that the effect sizes of pre-post um, change in the treatment students only within each of the universities was very similar across the universities. And so what we tentatively infer from this formative implementation study is that different professors um, use different pedagogies, um, but the course seems to create similar outcomes so far. And this is good news because we tried to develop the course in that way with the idea that we're going to give it away. 
and that everyone who teaches it, including each one of us each year, <laughs> changes it. And is there something, um, maybe the themes or the sequence of the themes that's sort of standard, but then there's a lot of room for variation in the way that those different themes are presented and um, taught. And so um, this result suggests that may be um, a possibility with this class. Oh, I'm so sorry. So we got follow-up data in June from, uh, it's a terrible, I, I used to I just used to really be the person in the audience that would say, how can they put up an F table? <laughs> Where is the graph? <laughs> Don't they know there's an audience out here? And so I apologize, I didn't have time for a graph here. Um, but I want to show you some follow-up data and um, being aware of the time, I'll just tell you that our, our follow-up sample was about 240 of the initial 500 students in the two cohorts. So we got about a 50% return rate in the COVID follow-up wave from the 2018 and 2019 cohorts. And then I engaged in a series of attrition analyses to decide who came back compared to the original 500. And suffice it to say that both the attrition um, and the base, uh, the attrition was equal from the controls and the match samples, and that the continuous sample that we were looking at in the follow-up and the attrition sample were no different at baseline on any measures. I don't think we can um, claim that the propensity match score stayed intact at the follow-up, but at least we could see um, that the attrition was not different from the treatment and control groups and that the resultant match sample um, was no different than the attritor sample on the baseline measure. So it gives us some confidence that whatever the follow-up data is, it's speaking to the original treatment and control groups even though they aren't matched anymore. And to make a long story short, what we found, and um, what we did is we put the data from the two cohorts together, um, and then we saw if condition, treatment control, and cohort mattered for the impact on these follow-up outcomes. For the 2018 cohort, that was an 18-month follow-up from the end of the course. For the 2019 cohort, that was only a six-month follow-up. So we wanted to know, did the time since the student had taken the course interact with their condition to affect these outcomes? And um, on the mental health outcomes, we found no cohort by treatment differences, suggesting that these treatment differences were uniform for students at both years. And so here's the F table, controlling for cohort and gender. We found study condition was associated with symptoms of depression, anxiety, depression, and well-being, as we had found before. Controlling for the pre-measures, time one, of these uh, outcomes, as well as the research state, first year student, sta student, sa student status, and student's race. These are quite small impacts, especially compared to the baseline, but they are significant. And um, even though the mean differences are small, these are the covariate adjusted means and standard errors at the different time points. Our follow-up results suggested that 18 months and six months later, the course was still um, associated with greater well-being and less distress among students. Then I went back because I was so curious and I just mapped the raw means for these three mental health outcomes across the three time points for each cohort. So you can see on the left, the three time points are fall, uh, pre, fall, post, and then 18 months later. And you can see there is a fade out effect if you just look at the raw means for anxiety for that 2018 cohort. The impact doesn't really seem to lead out 18 months, although these are without the control variables. Um, you can see for the 2019 cohort, however, at six month follow up, they seem to really be maintaining less symptoms of anxiety compared to the control group. This is the right side of the anxious symptoms figure. And then uh, similarly, a bit of a fade out for depressive symptoms for the 2018 cohort, 18 months later, 
but not so for the 2019 cohort. And the same with um, well-being's a bit different. The improvements in well-being seem enduring for both cohorts, uh, either 18 or six months later. I hope that's clear. Okay, just a few more and then we'll have time for questions. Uh, finally, we took some uh, COVID compliance items. Uh, how frequently do you wear a mask, wash your hands, avoid being in public, or um, just try to isolate at home? And to make a long story short, the women are smarter. That's right, that's right, as the Grateful Dead says. <laughs> women um, doing all of these behaviors more than the men in the study. The one interaction we found was that the uh, control males, there was a significant interaction of treatment by con uh, of condition by gender on face mask wearing in that the males who were in the control group were the least likely to wear the masks. Those who had taken the course, males and females reported equal frequency of mask wearing. And there may be something about, um, well, we can talk about masculinity beliefs and gender and the whole, <laughs> whatever's going on in the country, we're wearing a mask somehow. <laughs> Demasculates me, emasculates me, what's the word? <laughs> um, all right, so just to summarize and come to questions, there's some preliminary evidence with matched controls on self-report measures of improvement in attentional, social, emotional skills and perspectives on flourishing. We need archival data and behavioral data and biologic data, other kinds of data to really um, buttress our confidence in these findings beyond self-report. There's also some evidence that the course reduces symptoms of depression in particular. There's been this interesting thing in the uh, country where people are uh, and this was in the Twenge and Joyner study where actually anxiety is going down a little, but depression is coming up. So there may be a, a phase change where we're not as worried, but we're now just sort of uh, feeling a bit hopeless. The course seems to help with some of those feelings. There's no evidence that the course is changing risk behavior in the near term um, or health uh, behavior either. We hope to track that over a longer period of time. There was one impact of males who took the course wearing their masks a bit more. We seem to suggest that maybe professors can teach the course as they wish, but within some constraints and produce similar outcomes. And then sort of apropos studies that Stephanie and others are doing, the question really becomes, well, what are the inter interrelated processes leading from the course to these various outcomes? We've posited that changes in skills and worldview can help people interact with their experience and make meaning of that experience in new ways. But it's also possible we encourage the students to find communities, to find like-minded people who support flourishing and inquiry. Maybe they met um, new people in the class, maybe they come back to other classes. So it could be that social relationships and social networks could explain some of the findings on mental health and well-being. And we hope to look at these things in the future with other forms of uh, data and methodologies like interviews, um, et cetera. I'll just say we've been trying to, to, by way of conclusion, what happens next, we've been trying um, to create a corridor of classes for students who are interested in going on. And we've, um, some of these have been created and some of them are on the books. There's also the course that Elaine and Sabrina have taught on mindfulness for healthcare professionals. There's a course that Gabby um, Winquist teaches in, kinesi in kinesiology on yoga. So um, we're trying to create more flourishing courses so students can sort of repetitively come into a community to develop and learn these skills as they go through college. We've been um, running a network of about 10 different campuses across the state that are also either interested in or currently introducing the course. And we have a professional uh, network to support the implementation of the course in these various sites that we could talk about. There's a whole host of people here, including Blake and Molly and Elaine who are on this call. I wanna thank because we couldn't have done it without them. 
And we also want to thank uh, Schreier and the Office of General Ed, the Edna Bennett Pierce uh, Prevention Center and my chair, as well as Bridging the Theory for helping support the work. And so with that, in three minutes, and I apologize, <laughs> I will end and say thank you. Open to any questions or thoughts you have in the remaining time together. Thanks so much, Rob. It looks like you um, have a couple of uh, questions in the chat box. Oh, uh-huh. Um, the first question is, what did you think you did to get better outcomes from the second cohort? Um, well, we got a randomized control group, so we think that's improving <laughs> our estimates. But every year we've engaged in a um, process of continuous improvement around the course. And I think with what happened with George Floyd and everything this year, we're similarly engaged in a process of renewal and curricular revision. So even the names of the themes are changing constantly. And in some ways, this was our first, this was our five year plan to really work together and do formative research and this kind of research to see if we could um, get some signal that it was efficacious on the way to a more rigorous study and scaling and dissemination. So we'd like to think maybe the course is getting better outcomes because we're getting better at teaching it as we go forward. <clears throat> um, do students have any information on how they use their skills after they leave the course? <laughs> we, <laughs> Blake, I'm smiling with Blake because um, we had the foresight in the follow-up survey to ask them what have they learned during the pandemic um, in our follow-up sample. And it was amazing the things that students say that they were, they were learning, uh, which really in some ways seemed to be, at least for the treatment group, the application of these skills and we couldn't finish analyzing it. So <laughs> I can't tell you, but um, we think that the whole course has to be about the transfer of skills to life beyond the course. So your question is really, like the most important question. And we hope to find out more about that in the future. And I'll just say one way we're trying to do that is we've asked students to give us their written work. There's no exams in this course, it's only writing. And we think there's a lot of process oriented insights in their writing that we hope to mine in the future. Are there other questions that anyone would like to unmute and ask at this point? Yes, Mark. So Rob, there's been a tension between the three universities uh, about how big the kind of course can be. And you guys have kept it intimate uh, where students really get to know each other. Uh, the sections are also small. Uh, originally when we envisioned this, uh, some people thought this was gonna be, a, could be a 400 person or 600 person course. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about it now after you and Blake and others have gone through so many iterations. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, this is um, to find a scalable model, I think is elusive still. It is true that our friends at UVA want it to be 600, very much like the Yale course, 1000 students, I think, in the Yale course. And, um, and I'm probably at Wisconsin, that's the, the, the wish to to make it much larger. Um, my father used to always say, Mark, uh, son, life is a series of trade offs. <laughs> <laughs> and so <clears throat> I would think the same with the course. Um, uh, and I'll just say that the problem of scaling it is, is not different than the problem many of us in the PRC face around scaling the programs we promote. How do we get the training for the, the professional development to scale the trainers, to assess the high quality, to make sure there's a personal of quality, I think we all hopefully believe that there's a nonspecific effect of care in the work that we do in the classroom and in the prevention spaces that we work. And so I'll just be honest and say, I don't know the solution. I think it's a real tension. As it gets larger, it feels like it could become less personal without a lot of professional development and support of instructors. And so we're trying through these networks to, to figure out pathways to supporting more and more people to offer it. I kind of like the model, if I could get like 10 professors in the university to offer it 
to 50 students as opposed to one. <laughs> but I understand the economics of that are sort of uh, probably naive. So <laughs> thanks for the question, Mark. All right, well, I think we're at the end of the hour here, but thank you so much. That was such a great presentation. Thank you so much for having me and be well, everyone. Take care.